Hi peeps all over the world. I have the pleasure to introduce to you It Happened Here, the first podcast I've ever followed because it's brilliant and because it's written and produced by my little sister, Kate Thompson davey But I assure you, you will not be disappointed. Thank you so much for that intro to my big sister, Sandy. First of all, I want to start off by saying sorry that I wasn't able to get an episode out last week. Um, if you're South African, you will know all about the difficulties that load shedding has created for any of us who are doing any sort of business online. And if you're not South African, I don't even know how to begin explaining that our major national electricity provider has done so little maintenance over the last few decades that we are now in our 13th year of scheduled blackouts. That means we just do without electricity for hours on end, day after day. It's not every week, uh, but the last couple of weeks have been particularly bad, and it means that I can barely fit my paying work into business hours and after hours, let alone anything else like this podcast, which, even though I love, means hours and hours at my computer and having reliable internet. So that's my excuse. I am sorry. Uh, the other thing that I want to say right up front is that I am recording in my bedroom for various reasons, and so that means we're back to the caveat from right in the beginning of the show, which was if you hear snoring in the background, it is one of my two beloved dogs, most likely Scouty. On the plus side, however, I have my favorite job, which is to give a shout out to patrons of the show. Those are the people who've gone along to patreon.com and found us and decided to support the show directly through their own hard-earned cash. That allows me to do things like pay for hosting of the episodes or offset some of the various costs around production that crop up. And it's really, really appreciated. Of course, not everyone can be a patron and I understand that and that's totally cool. I just ask that you come along and listen and enjoy and if you do love what you hear please consider leaving us a review particularly on apple podcasts or subscribing wherever you are so the patrons who i need to thank this week are kirsty with no last name thanks kirsty jamie stewart janita kirsten and chris Dillon, who i know is representing himself and the lovely danya at the same time so thank you all of you and now on with the show. This is episode 18 of It Happened Here. We've covered a couple of cases recently that have made big news. Either because the person in question was already a local celebrity like axe-murdering rugby player Pindile Nchungwana, or because the case spanned international waters, as with the Annie Devani hijack or hit saga. And this case is another one in that vein. The subject of today's episode is Nkululeko Habedi, also known by his musical persona or nickname, Flubber. Flubber's case attracted a lot of media attention because he was already famous as a member of the South African hip-hop collective Squatter Camp, and for his work as a solo artist. Flubber himself was born in Soweto in 1977, and later moved with his parents to Alexandra. So he was a Josie guy through and through, and when he became successful, he stuck true to those roots, buying a home in Alex that he would share with two cousins, Mpo and Luanda, and his brother Chapang. Flubber's on-again, off-again girlfriend, Sindisiwe Mankela, also stayed there from time to time. Now, Squatter Camp, um, S-K-W-A-T-T-A, K-A-M-P, is a pretty obvious play on a crappy word for informal settlement. But Flubber's nickname was a lot less obvious to me. So I read with interest that it was a self-given nickname of his. The story goes that his granny once admonished him saying that she was flabbergasted by his naughtiness. Nkululeko loved the sound of that, and after he looked it up in the dictionary, he instructed his family to call him Flubber from then on, 
perhaps foreshadowing his love of and ability to play with words, a skill he used to great success as a rapper. He also briefly went by the name Hound as part of a rap twosome with Musa Wenkosi Molefe, aka Nish, who he went to school with. Nish was also part of the Squatter Camp Collective. Flubber finished school with his matric certificate at John Orr Technical College in Mill Park, Johannesburg. And under pressure from his parents to do something productive, he enrolled at Allenby Campus to study computer science. But it wasn't the direction he wanted to go, and he left before his first year was up. Flubber had a whole other idea for his future. He wanted to make music, like his idol, Snoop Dogg. That's when Nish and Flubber and five other musicians would start Squatter Camp, whose debut album and follow-ups took the South African charts by storm in the 2000s. Their two most famous tracks from back in the day are arguably Clapsong and Umoya. And although they've had a long period of quiet since their last album, I recently read that they're putting together new music, despite the loss of two members of the group, including Nish, just this year from COVID complications. In the late 90s, Flubber met Mpo and they had a child together. I've tried really hard to find Mpo's maiden name for the sake of telling the story, but I can not I can only find her referred to as Mpo Hebedi. In 2000, they had a daughter called the Sejo, and although they broke up after around a decade together, the two remained close and co-parented the Sejo. In 2013, Flubber had a son called Tsehfato with his then-girlfriend, Korabo Shole, someone he'd also known since childhood. And there was a third significant love interest in his life, Cindy Siwe Mankela, who is most often called Cindy. He and Cindy had dated on and off for years, and they were very much on again in 2015, where we will be focusing today. Cindy was born in 1989. Her parents lived in Kempton Park, and her father was a retired police captain. After school, she studied economics. By all accounts, their relationship had its ups and downs. Flubber was 12 years older than Cindy and had first started dating her when she was just 17 and he was still married. There are various reports of them breaking things off at different times, one or both of them seeing other people, and Cindy was often flying between Ireland, where she was studying, and South Africa. At one point, Cindy was pretty much set on heading back to her studies and forgetting about Flubber forever. Text messages between them that later became part of the public record in this case show that Cindy said she'd had enough of being essentially his side chick when he was still married and his cheating with additional women even years into their relationship. But Flubber managed to convince her, with the help of his mother, Agatha, to give things another shot. So, in 2015, Cindy was staying at Flubber's place in Alex, more on than off. On the evening of March 8, 2015, Flubber, Cindy and some of their friends are all set for a night out at one of Joburg's swankiest spots, the Sands in Santon. They are meeting up with another of Squatter Camp's stars, Lebohang Sugarsmacks Motibe, and Flubber is set to perform with Sugarsmacks at the venue. From later testimony, the general consensus seems to be that the evening started well. Flubber, Cindy, and their friends, and Kululeko Chaoke, and his girlfriend Masejo, are all in high spirits when they get to the club. Once inside, though, the upbeat mood doesn't last long. As might be expected, there are lots of people hanging around the rappers, and Cindy quickly gets irritated when it looks like Flubber's flirting not only with the band manager's girlfriend, but with one of his own ex-girlfriends, a woman various witnesses later identify as Kia. Now, just to be clear, this is one version of events. In later testimony, Cindy herself denies even knowing who Kia was, never mind getting irritated by her. But various friends of the couple have a different story. According to this version, Kia came to their table helped herself to the bottle of whiskey sitting in the centre of it, and spent a flirty two minutes chatting to Flubber, all while Cindy sat seething in the background. Once Kia clears off, Cindy quickly translates her displeasure into a full-blown argument with her boyfriend, but they're cut short when it's Flubber's turn to take the stage. This seems, however, to set the tone for the rest of the evening, 
At one point, Cindy, with Masejo in tow, is flirtatiously chatting to a couple of guys, until eventually Flabber marches up and tells her it's time for them to leave. There are reports that there might have been an altercation between the rapper, his friend in Kululeko, and the two gents chatting up their respective girlfriends. Cindy is pretty pissed off at this point, and everyone's had a bit of a drink. She asks Flubber, Why is it okay for you to flirt with other women, but when I talk to guys, suddenly we have to leave? You can't tell me what to do. You don't pay my bills. Now, if you're wondering about that last bit, you know, the bit about him not paying her bills, well, there's some other accounts of this argument that suggest that money was an issue here too. For starters, despite being a well-known artist, Flabber wasn't pulling in a lot of dosh anymore. There are even suggestions that Cindy was the one paying for the drinks that night and for the petrol they'd used to drive out there, and there are some men who presumably would find that an embarrassing state of affairs if you're a somewhat famous rapper out in the town with your much younger girlfriend. I don't have direct sight of the state of his finances, so I want to be clear here that this is all about making sense of a swirling set of hearsay and contradicting narratives. But whatever the truth is, you have booze, jealousy, anxiety, and insecurity all at play, and that is not a good mix for keeping cool heads. Soon, the group head out to the parking lot. Here, things kick up another notch, with the pair at the center of everything, Flubber and Cindy, fighting verbally, but heatedly. Nkululeko goes to get the car, and Cindy calls a metered taxi, attempting to go her own way that night. But when the driver arrives, Cindy is already gone. They drop off the two friends and make their way back to Flubber's home and Alex, just the two of them. When they get home, Flubber's cousin, Mpo, and a mutual friend, Tapelo, are sitting outside the house, chilling and listening to music. They see Cindy storm off and lock herself in Flubber's bedroom, and the rapper himself approaches shortly thereafter. According to them, Flubber is in pretty good spirits as he sheepishly tells them that he and Cindy are arguing. The two say he even joined them for a bit, singing along to some of the tracks being played, maybe to give Cindy some time to cool off, or maybe he just doesn't want to face the fight again. It's when Flubber tries to go into his bedroom and finds it locked that things start to get really ugly. He knocks at the door, demanding that she open up, and when that doesn't work, he storms outside and goes round to the window, swearing about her locking him out of his own home. Eventually, she relents and unlocks the door, and the rest... Well, the rest is what happened according to Cindy, because of the two of them, she's the only one that walks out of that room again. Leander says later that he heard the couple arguing from his own room for about 30 minutes, and then he saw Cindy come running out of the room, screaming for help, telling him she had accidentally killed Flubber. He followed her into Flubber's bedroom and found the rapper alive, but bleeding out on the floor. The knife had entered his body between two ribs, right over his heart. While the two waited for emergency services to arrive, Luyanda and Cindy try giving Flubber CPR, Cindy telling him, I love you, it was a mistake. The ambulance takes over an hour to arrive, which really makes me want to launch into a whole other rant about how stretched and inadequate our emergency services are in this country, especially when it comes to responding in township areas. But I'll hold off on that for now. When they finally get there, Flubber is pronounced dead at the scene. After the police arrive, Cindy is distraught and even makes an apparent attempt on her own life by cutting into her wrist with a broken bottle. But she's restrained, and the paramedics patch her up. She is arrested on the spot. She'll need medical treatment and stitches for the gash to her wrist and at least one of the cuts to her stomach. Cindy makes her first court appearance the very next day. She shows the court the wounds, the bruises and cuts she sustained while she says, fighting for her life. According to Cindy's account, when she unlocked that door, Flubber pushes it open hard enough to knock her to the ground. He's furious and holding a steak knife in one hand 
as he berates her, seemingly in a fit of jealousy, about the other men she'd been talking to. Again, in Cindy's version, she quickly realizes she needs to get the hell out of the situation, but Flubber pins her to the bed, placing the knife on the bedside table. He repeatedly demands to know who she was fucking when she was out of town, and she says he spits on her, rubbing it in her face. Now, if we take her version at face value, any woman in this situation would clearly be terrified that they're not going to get out of it alive. So when Flubber releases her and tells her to pack her thing and get out of his fucking house, and that's a quote, she quickly complies. The reprieve is short-lived. In the next moment, he's grabbed her again, and this time he's pinned her to the bed while he holds the knife in one hand and starts cutting across her stomach. Cindy, meanwhile, is begging him to stop and manages to wrestle the knife away and push him off the bed. She runs for the door, with the weapon tightly clutched in her right hand, but before she has a chance to get out the door, he's on her again. He spins her around and is holding her by the arms this time as he shakes her and knocks her against the wall and the door. And this is where the crux of the case kicks in, because what happened in the next few moments forms the basis for Cindy's defense. She wrenches away from him just as Flubber leans in, and in that moment, the knife slides into his chest, finding the worst spot it could, right between those two ribs. Yes, this is the defense Cindy has chosen to go with, at least in the early stages. She was trying to escape. She pushed at him. The knife went in. It was a complete accident, and she only realized what had happened as he staggered away from her. In one source, her lawyer is quoted saying, as she tried to break away from him, he leaned forward, landing on the knife. And others at the house say Flubber could be heard shouting, this bitch just stabbed me. And then she stumbles out of the room, calling for help. And that's when the stories align again. Cindy's defense, as I said, is that she acted in self-defense. And even then, what happened, the stabbing, was unintentional. In this, it seems like it might be an open and shut case of self-defense against an abusive lover. But the prosecution isn't buying it. And the state's case includes the argument that if he had wanted to kill her that night, her wounds would have been worse, which I must say is a deeply appalling thing to have read. The state also says that at least some of the wounds were self-inflicted. This becomes one of the key points of contention in the early stages of trial, and a doctor will testify that A, not all her wounds could be self-inflicted, and B, that they are consistent with at least some of the aspects of Cindy's version. Frustratingly, though, not all of the medical evidence in question is available to us, because somehow, in this one particularly crucial case, the clinic where Cindy was initially treated had managed to lose those medical records. Sam, who helped me prep this case, wrote four words at this point in the notes, just, quote, really guys, really though? And I have little of any eloquence to add to that. This is the level of incompetence in record keeping we're dealing with, and if it makes me, as a true crime storyteller, want to scream and rage, I can't even fathom the frustration that the advocates arguing the case must feel. So all I have for you on that point is a heartfelt, really? Despite this epic cock-up, by the time the trial goes to the High Court in September, the evidence that will be used to seal Cindy's fate isn't her own wounds. Rather, a state-appointed forensic pathologist testifies that, given the size of the wound on Flubber's chest and the jagged damage done to one of the ribs on the way in, it is, quote, highly unlikely that the stabbing was accidental. To that expert, it looks decidedly more like a deliberate attack, especially given the kind of force that would be needed to drive the weapon all the way into the heart. Cindy listens to this testimony impassively in court, her head covered in a scarf, as it has been for all of her appearances thus far. What she's thinking and feeling in that moment, we don't know. But whatever happened that night, it seems that accidental is off the table. 
and when she takes to the witness box after the court has heard several days of testimony from experts and others present at the house that night, she drops the pretense and a bombshell, saying, quote, I stabbed him intentionally. The mistake was killing him. On December 9, 2015, ten months since that March night when Flava was stabbed, Sindisiwe Mantgela is found guilty of murder with intent. During the sentencing, members of Flubber's family said that he had been the glue that held them together and the rift of his death had left them bereft and divided. In mitigation of sentence, however, the defense's team representatives argued that Cindy should be considered a candidate for correctional supervision rather than imprisonment because she was a first-time offender who had acted without premeditation and had shown clear remorse. As an aside, the judge, Judge uh, Soli Sitole, said a bunch of very weird and very not okay things during his judgment, including, quote, the court needs to punish for deterrence to stop you from committing future crimes, to stop you from killing your future boyfriend, end quote which is not really how justice works, and I would like to think a judge knows that. He also lectured her on the fact that in other countries she may have received a death sentence, detailing the lethal injection and even a description that, quote, some African countries, they took offenders to a ditch where they opened fire on them until they died, end quote. Which I I don't know. I, I don't know what that has got to do with the case in front of him, other than sounding like some paternalistic bullshit. Cindy was sentenced to 12 years in prison for the murder of Nkuleleko Flaba Habedi. That's a shorter term than the usual mandatory minimum of 15 years for murder. In his judgment, Judge Sitole stated that the court was showing mercy in this regard because, to some extent, Cindy herself was a victim of the situation and because she had shown that remorse by immediately trying to perform CPR as Flubber lay dying. But the judgment is also a bit of a contradiction in some ways, because he recommends that she only be eligible for parole after serving two-thirds of her sentence. Normally, this would apply after half your sentence. If she gets parole, Cindy might be a free woman again as soon as 2023, She will be in her 30s, with potentially many decades ahead of her. Decades Flubber never got. In many people's eyes, Cindy is a cold killer. And I have a lot of sympathy for his loved ones who hold that view. I've watched a number of interviews with Flubber's family, including his daughter and his ex-partners, who all speak in glowing terms about him. And both of the mothers of his two children have said that he was not violent with them at any point in their relationships. But, and it's a but big enough that Sir Mixalot would approve, that doesn't mean that the relationship between these two hadn't turned volatile and possibly abusive. There is evidence from witnesses and in their text exchanges that both were angry and jealous about the other's behaviour. Then there is the fact that Cindy tried to extricate herself from the situation at least once by calling that taxi, and perhaps more than once. She would present screenshots of call logs in court, showing that she had phoned friends who hadn't answered that night. She says she was calling for help. She'd also been packing to leave that night, in the middle of their fight. Cindy's bruises and her word that she feared for her life in that moment, have stayed with me. Flubber still has adoring fans who may be incensed to hear this, but I'm not sure I would have convicted her for murder with intent. It's a difficult call, I concede, because death is a reasonable expectation to anticipate if you willingly stab someone, as she ultimately admitted she did. But I see no evidence of premeditation, and lots that there was an escalating fight that had already turned violent. And I wonder what I would have done in that moment to get away, to protect myself. So I guess I'm sitting here holding two positions simultaneously. 
sympathy for those who lost their beloved brother, father, son, and also sympathy for a woman who I personally believe acted on instinct to protect herself. We can judge her decision, but I hope we will never find ourselves having to make the same call. This episode was written and researched by Samantha Render and me, Kate Thompson-Davey. IHH is a Ready Freddy production. Please come find us on Facebook and Insta and let me know what you think and what other cases you want to hear. Mm-hmm.